everyone to our guest speaker event today. My name is Neha and I'm a student partner here at the EC. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I'm super excited to introduce our guest in just a minute. But first, I want to give you a quick rundown of how the event is going to go today. So I'm going to start by introducing our guest with a little bio so you'll get to learn a little bit more about his journey. Um, and then we will go into a little interview. And then we will head into a Q&A where you will all have the opportunity to introduce yourself and ask any questions that you might have. So our questions for me will be largely based on our pillars of entrepreneurial thinking over here on the wall if you want to take a look. Um, we use these as the central ideas for everything we do here at the EP because we believe they're essential in developing the skills and mindset of an entrepreneur. So we'll place them in the chat for those online to take a look as well. Okay, with that being said, I'm really excited to introduce our guest, Joe Belger Belgerle, to the EC community today. So Joe graduated from William & Mary in 2015 with degrees in finance and government. Following graduation, he founded Major Clarity, a career exploration and academic planning platform that has grown to serve thousands of schools and millions of students across 35 states. In addition to his current role as CEO of Major Clarity, Joe has worked as an interim finance director and campaign treasurer for a congressional campaign and as a speaker for Fears of Freedom. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. How are you doing? Um, doing wonderful and, and happy to be here. Thanks for having me and, and looking forward to the chat. Hopefully it's valuable for the people tuning in. Of course, thank you so much. All right, well, we'll just jump right into it. So first question, what were some of your interests and how do you see them having shaped the entrepreneurial side of yourself today? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I think um, interests is, is uh, maybe a tough one because I don't know if like my per se interests are what led to me kind of pursuing an entrepreneurial uh, journey. It's almost like the antithesis of that or the opposite of that. Like I was interested in so many things that I couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do. And that ended up leading to me wanting to help other people figure out what they wanted to do. Right. And so I feel like people kind of get into the, an entrepreneurial journey through one of two means. They either have a desire to be an entrepreneur, which is like, oh, I'm constantly looking for problems I can solve. I'm trying to look for ideas. I'm kind of trying to come up with things I can start. Um, or they just become really obsessed with the problem and decide that I'm going to fix it at all costs. Right. And I was definitely in the latter boat. Like I, I wasn't necessarily setting out to try to raise venture capital or, or build or grow this business. I mean, I was interested in entrepreneurial things. I was interested in kind of like doing your own thing. But at the time I, like when I was going through college, I thought I was going to end up in politics or government. And then I thought I was going to end up in finance. And then I worked in social work in New York city. And it was through those experiences that I ended up realizing, Hey, I don't, I don't know how to figure out what I want to do. So I want to go help other people do that and, and believe that the best way to do that was through an entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, but it wasn't per se, oh, I was always interested in owning a business or starting a business um, or, or trying to look for avenues to kind of go down that path, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a pretty common story we've heard from a lot of our founders is they tend to be more generous or productive and specialists. So as a recent grad, can you tell us a little bit how your time at William & Mary shaped your first job? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm always like a little bit wary to um, fully share because I, I don't want to put the institution in a hard spot because they were wonderful to me. But my journey at William & Mary was very unconventional and, and I don't know if it's recreatable and I don't want to say like, oh yeah, you can just go do these things because I think they even kind of stopped allowing some of the things I, I did, but um, William and Mary was incredibly flexible with me and in, in helping un, me in my journey because I wasn't somebody who was meant for the classroom. Um, I really wasn't meant to be in a classroom. It just, it didn't click for me. And there were multiple points where I had considered dropping out for that reason. Um, but I was really fortunate that I met many different people along my journey in William and Mary who took the time to get to know me and I was able to really convince them of that. And they made exceptions to allow my education to be a little bit unconventional. And so my freshman year, I ended up leaving campus and participating in the William and Mary in Washington program that is usually targeted more on like the junior side that allows you to kind of work full time 
um, and take night classes. And, and so that was really incredible, but helped me understand I didn't want to pursue politics or government. And then there were a lot of other experiences, you know, working with some professors in the entrepreneurship um, depart or department and in the business school, I did an independent study around actually when I was starting to ideate about major clarity and like think there was something there that I could, at the time, I wasn't even calling it major clarity, but um, just like helping other students figure out what they want to do with their life. And they allowed me to turn that into an independent study and, and get a lot of credits from that. And I was able to participate in a, a program through the business school as well, um, where I helped to consult the university specifically on the dining program and was able to turn that into a class. And so I look back at my time at William & Mary, and I definitely credit a lot of that flexibility and support that I got with getting me onto a path that really made sense for me. And, and I always tell people I'm, I'm incredibly grateful of that, but you know, full disclosure, transparency, not trying to say anything I shouldn't. At times, um, I've also had folks from William & Mary who have supported me say, hey, like, try to make people, make sure people know, like, you, when you say that, they can't come ask. <laughs> like, you know, I think they kind of changed some of the things and realized maybe that's not always the best thing. And I totally agree and realize that that might not be the most scalable or best thing to have from a policy perspective and some of the experiences I got to do, but I'm very grateful for them because I don't think I would be here without that flexibility that I was able to have within my education. Yeah, it's great to hear that you had such a great experience. Was there anything you wish you took more advantage of while you were here? You know, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think the one thing I really look back on sometimes and think is, I wish I had spent a little more time um, just enjoying things without knowing where they were headed, if that makes sense. Like, I think I was in such a rush to like figure out my whole life that, you know, like my freshman year, I left to go work for the Senate and take night classes and do something that only upperclassmen were doing. And, you know, looking back on one hand, I have zero regrets because who knows, that might have been the domino that led to all these things in my life being what it is now. And on the other hand, I look back and think, I was a college freshman, who cared if I knew what I wanted to do with my life, right? Just enjoy the time with my friends, enjoy the time on campus, deepen those relationships. So sometimes I look back and think, you know, maybe I was I was too in a rush to try to figure things out. Um, and but I wouldn't call it a regret because I think everything that happened led to where I am now, and I'm very happy with where I am now. Um, but other than that, I, I don't think anything comes to mind. Yeah, it's hard to find that balance, but it's good advice to hear as current students. Yeah. Um, so it seems like your experience as a student shaped this a little bit, but can you tell us a little more about what inspired you to enter this industry and jump right into being an entrepreneur right out of college? Yeah, so I, I, um, I had worked, so I started working pretty young overall. I got my first job. Uh, when I was 12 years old, and then I worked all through middle school and high school. Uh, I was a contractor. I worked for the government. I worked in construction. I worked for restaurants. Um, I did some professional work too on on kind of the finance side. Um, and then I kind of continued that through my college experience. And so, like I said, my freshman year, I worked for the Senate Finance Committee, and then I worked for a financial technology company. And then I worked for a startup in a customer support and biz dev role. I spent a couple months up in New York City working in uh, social work with a nonprofit. And through all of these experiences, I always found things that I really enjoyed about the work. But I, I always found things where I was like, you know what, this isn't the right place for me long term. And so I, uh, it was around my junior year. I figured if it was going into my junior year or before my junior year, but it was sometime around my junior year. And I was coming back to campus and I didn't have any of these kind of like other experiences lined up. So it was going to just be like a normal kind of college credit on campus, on classroom year. And I remember just feeling really frustrated because I felt like I had been more proactive than anyone else like I had seen my age in terms of trying to figure out what I wanted to do and gaining work experience and trying out different things. And I still had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and I was like, if, if I haven't been able to figure it out through all these experiences, how the heck are people supposed to figure this out, right? Unless you just get lucky and find that kind of perfect fit right away. And so that summer actually for when an internship and I moved down to New Orleans and I worked with an educational lab and I was, I, the only purpose of that was 
I wanted to help kids figure out what they wanted to do with their life. So I built this thing that I called like course trainships, which didn't scale, but it was a great experience where I would work with college freshmen, incoming college freshmen to put together a two week project based learning course with a mentor so they could test drive a college major before they actually had to, you know, choose one. Um, I did informational seminars and informational nights for high school kids. I did matchmaking between industry professionals and high school kids. And overall was just like doing a bunch of random non-scalable work to try to help students at the end of high school or the beginning of college figure out what they wanted to do with their life. And when I was doing that work, I started to recognize a lot of patterns and trends uh, around the content that was most impactful and, and most was moving the needle for students. And so then that's when I really became obsessed with what turned into major clarity. Um, that was when I, you know, worked with the business school to turn it into an independent study to do a research project around if there was actually a market need for that. That's when we ended up um, applying for and winning a year-long research pilot with New York City Department of Education to try to build out, you know, an initial MVP of a version of a platform that scaled out some of this content that I had realized was high impact in terms of helping people figure out what they wanted to do with their life. And that's kind of where the crystallization of wanting to build major clarity really came from. And then um, I think, you know, for me, one of the things like we all have things we do well, we all have things we, we don't do well. Right. And I think one of the things that like inherently is sometimes tough for high achieving or, or, you know, really smart and capable young people is they overestimate negative consequences of downside outcomes. Right. And so I kind of just looked at it and I was like, what's the worst possible thing that can happen from me going full time and doing this for a year or two? Right. I don't get the job at Deloitte or booze or wherever else that all of my friends are getting the job at out of William and Mary. I go do this thing for a year or two. And then a year from now, I get the job at Deloitte or booze or wherever else. And I'm just 12 to 18 months behind them. But within 10 years, starting that career 12 months won't matter. If I can outwork or outachieve them within 12 years, I'll be ahead of where I was if I had started 12 months earlier anyway. So who cares, right? Like there's no real downside. Who cares about what? And, and the other thing is like, people don't really think about you, right? Like I think sometimes you're worried like, oh, people are going to think I'm a failure. Oh, people are going to wonder, well, where's Joe? Or people are going to wonder, you know, my first year working on Major Clarity out of college, I made $9,000. Um, and I lived in Washington, DC. I, I literally had to survive on less than a dollar a day for nine months. Um, and so I never did social things. I never like participated in things. Nobody cares. Nobody notices, right? Like I still lived with my friends and it was great. And I saw them. I just, when we'd go out, I would never get food or I would never get a drink or whatever else. And so I think I was able to just see like, there's not really much downside risk to trying this at this age and this point in my life. Um, you know, worst case scenario is I move back home or live out of my car. Like who cares? That's not the end of the world. Then I'll go get a job and like things go on. And, and so I, I just became really obsessed with wanting to solve this problem and didn't think the downside was that significant, but I thought the upside was tremendously significant. Um, and, and so I, I said, let's do it. And, and after school decided to just go full time into uh, trying to figure out this major clarity thing. Well, it sounds like you have a very big tolerance for ambiguity that pretty hard to achieve. Um, but you mentioned a few challenges of uh, being a young entrepreneur. Obviously, money is a huge thing for businesses. So what were some of the resources you used? Yeah, so, um, I mean, you know, first things first, like, you, you got to, like, lean on communities, right? And so, like, that year that I mentioned, that, you know, that I, I was living on less than a dollar a day, I would go to every startup and every networking event I could possibly go to half the time, not even caring about the networking because it might not be perfectly targeted at me, but I would just eat like I would literally just like eat the food and bring it home and like use that. And like my local library by my house, I, you know, I couldn't afford office space, didn't have anywhere to work out of. And this was before work from home was as big of a thing. And so I felt like I needed a work environment. I literally used to just go to my library and work every day from the library. I would be there till 8 or 9 p.m. I would rent a room. They, I, I made friends with the librarians. And so you were supposed to only be able to rent the 
private rooms for like one or two hours at a time. But like I explained what I was doing and trying to do and how little resources I had. And they would just let me rent out the room all day. So I had a private office basically at the library. And so like there's a lot of these little things along the way that I leaned on the community for, uh, you know, food, workspace, all these services, advice, consulting, like all of these other services. And then there were also a couple of organizations that were really helpful and impactful. I was fortunate to get into Lighthouse Labs which gave me a $20,000 grant um, during that year, which mostly went into the business, but did provide me some of that income that I was able to live off of um, and, and provided a lot of mentorship and a peer network of founders. Um, the other thing is I started a group, or I didn't just start it, a group of us did, but we joked that it was called founder therapy, but I, I kind of built a group with five other founders who were kind of all in no matter what going to make this work. And we would meet every single month and it was our founder therapy. You know, it was like shared resources, shared learning, shared empathy, um, consulting each other, et cetera. And so I think there were a lot of different things. I'm certainly not naming all of them. There was, there was tons and tons of people and institutions and organizations that supported me um, during those times. But uh, I think you just got to be scrappy and, and look for ways to kind of lean on the community and, and get things done um, when you're in that phase. But the thing is, people love to support people in that situation, especially when it's a non-financial ask, right? Like I wasn't going to groups and saying, hey, give me money or going to the library asking for anything. I was like, hey, can you just let me work out of this room all day? Or, hey, can you let me take some of this food home that you've already purchased, you know, et cetera. And when it's things like that, that are pretty easy for people to do, and they can do it in a way that's supporting somebody who's like young and hungry and ambitious and trying to change the world and all that jazz. Um, I think people really want to do that. And so you just have to be willing to kind of vulnerably put yourself out there and ask. Yeah, community is super important. And that's a big thing of what we're trying to do here at the East is build that community, that network of people that you can always lean on. So switching gears a little bit more towards the operation of major, major clarity, how do you market your services to your customers and what methods have you found to be more or less effective? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we were actually pretty anti-marketing um, for a while. I will say, like, I've learned a lot. I don't know if I would redo everything that I did the same exact way. But for the business I was trying to build, I think we did things the right way. You know, we we did a lot of things that are kind of counterintuitive or antithetical to what the typical kind of VC-backed startup mindset is, right? Like, be splashy, focus on design, get press, do a lot of outbound marketing, like, go to events and do all these things. So, I, you know, the first couple of salespeople we folk, we hired, I built into everybody's heads and myself included that we didn't know enough to do those things, right? Like marketing, you can A-B test marketing. You can see who's opening emails, who's not, who's clicking on things, who's not, but you can't get the qualitative reasonings behind that stuff without talking to the people, right? Like you still only get this quantitative A-B test. And we didn't know enough to even be at that stage of go to market. And so, you know, like a lot of times there's, there's two frameworks for building a startup, optimizing for time to success or time to failure, or optimizing for likelihood of success or likelihood of failure. And a lot of the venture capital model is optimizing for time to success or time to failure, right? They don't care about maximizing your chances of success. They care about truncating the period it takes you to become a success and the size and scope of that success you can be. And so if you don't care about your likelihood of success, you just want to know within one week or one year, whether this is going to be a unicorn or not, then yeah, just go like pour a, money, a bunch of money or resources into outbound marketing and all of these other things. But if you're really trying to optimize towards likelihood of success, I view it as more of customer development than marketing, because we had to figure out who our customers were, what they cared about, how to speak their language, how to talk to them before it was even going to be effective for us to test outbound marketing and A-B test emails and subject lines and all of those other things, you know, yeah, we could have hacked together emails that might have produced results, but we wouldn't have known why they were producing results. We would have just had these hypotheses instead of truly and intimately understanding our customers. And I wanted us to understand our customers better than anyone in the market. And that comes from either having industry expertise, which we did not, or synchronous time with those customers. So the only thing we did were in-person visits and cold calls. Uh, in our first 18 months, 
me, and then eventually two other people made over 20,000 cold calls. So you can kind of run the numbers on how many calls everybody was doing how many, every day. And like, that's all we did. I was logging 25 to 30,000 miles in my car because when we couldn't get through to districts on the phone, I would just show up at school districts. And, you know, I would never lie, but I would use little hacks in my language like, oh, I'm here for my meeting with so-and-so, right? I, that's, that wasn't a lie. I didn't say, oh, yeah, they, if somebody said, oh, I don't see you on their calendar, did they know about it? Then I wouldn't lie. But half the time, the front desk would just hear that and be like, oh, yeah, okay, go right in. And so, like, that's what our marketing was. Our marketing was like guerrilla marketing, like high intensity, cold calls, visit people in person, talk, learn, because every time we were selling or marketing, I wanted us to be learning uh, more about who our customer was, what they cared about, what we needed to build in order to be able to close the deal and, and how we could get them on board. So that really, and it wasn't even like that was our first six to 12 months. That was probably our first three to three and a half years of go to market. We didn't hire our first marketing person until a year and a half ago um, when we were already serving thousands of schools and, and uh, in like 25 states or so that was in, in about 40, we were 35, maybe 40 employees before we hired a single marketing person. I mean, it sounds like you're really focused on solving the problem and finding a, an effective solution, which is really great to hear. So you mentioned some of those earlier, um, that work you were doing in BC that wasn't as scalable. So what made major clarity different from those endeavors? Yeah. So, I mean, I think you can kind of, uh, this is a broad assumption, right? I'm not saying this is applicable to every situation and you could easily poke holes in what I'm about to say, but loosely, I think you can kind of broadly try to go broad, like wide or go deep. Right. And so the things that weren't as scalable were going really, really deep. I was just spending time with all of these students and saying, what are you interested in? Who do you want to connect with? Connecting them. And then like literally listening in on their conversations, writing down the questions they asked, asking them which questions were the most effective, which questions were the most impactful. I was facilitating small group cohort programming for hours every single day myself, right? And that impact was really deep and it was really personalized, but it wasn't going to be able to go really broad. It wasn't going to be able to go really wide. And so I think I ended up kind of having this crossroads moment where I started to recognize patterns and trends. And, and look, this is a loose approximation, but I always look back and say, you know, from all of those experiences, I realized roughly 60 to 70% of the value were coming from the same things. They were coming from the same questions, the same types of activities, the same content, the same learnings. 30 to 40% of the value was completely unique for every single student. And so then you have to ask yourself, do I want to solve 90 to 100% of the value for every single student, but only be able to serve this many students? Or do I want to go solve 60 to 70% of the value for all these students and be able to pre-build these things so I can serve every single student in America? And, and that was the route I ended up taking of, great, if 60 to 70% of the value comes from content around these topics, these questions, or these items, I'll just go build the content for those topics, those questions, those items for all of these pathways and put it into a platform. And then I have something that I can bring to every single kid in America. And no, it doesn't get any student 100% of the way there, but it gets all of them 60 to 70% of the way there for free, incredibly quickly and incredibly scalably. Well, it sounds like you have reached a lot of that breadth and you're serving so many students right now, so it's good to hear. All right, this is going to be the last question for me, but based on your journey, um, which one of our pillars of entrepreneurial thinking would you want to work on leveraging more and why? It should be in the chat as well if you want to take another look at them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I appreciate that. So I think, you know, you, you kind of um, mentioned this at the beginning, but I think it would probably be some some combination between openness to risk and tolerance for ambiguity, right? I mean, I think I could say grit because um, that's a cliche, right? Like Angela Duckworth, that's the most important attribute to succeed. And like, it, that's absolutely true. Like you just have to be able to get punched in the face over and over. Like there were, there were so many times in this journey where like I just was on the brink of like mental collapse. Like we've been sued multiple times. I went without getting paid, skipped paychecks. You know, at one point we were spending $120,000 a month and we had 3K in the bank account 
and payroll was due in seven days. And we had no idea where that money was going to come from. Um, and so like grit is, is essential, but it's such a cliche. I want to dive into the ambiguity uh, and the openness to risk, because I think a lot of people when they're young overestimate how risky these things are. And if you're able to just slow yourself down and look at things from a purely rational standpoint, then you can understand that there's a lot more upside and a lot less downside to these types of endeavors than people often think, right? And like, I think the example I'll give is like blackjack, which I know obviously card counting's not really allowed or tolerated anymore, right? But if you knew how to count cards, blackjack wasn't gambling right? You might lose in a given day. You might lose over a given weekend and you needed to be able to tolerate and afford those losses. So I get there is some downside there, but if you implemented the system and just played the numbers and played the odds, the law of large numbers, the more you do it, it's going to work out. And I say that because, you know, when I was talking with, I have a mentor who's been incredibly, incredibly successful and I've gotten very close with him. And this was probably four or five years ago, like one to two years into my journey with major clarity. And he was like asking me this kind of question because he has kids roughly my age and wanted to encourage them into entrepreneurship and things like that. He's like, why, why'd you do this? Or how do you think about this or whatever? I forget exactly how it got brought up, but, and I told him, I said, you know, I just looked at the, the numbers, right? Um, I looked at it and I said, okay, the average startup has 90% of startups fail, Right. Let's say that I have a little more grit, a little more tenacity, a little more tolerance for pain than the average person. And also, it probably takes a little bit of ego to start a startup because you're literally saying I can do this better than anyone else. And that's why I'm going to build this company. So like that probably factors into it, too, which may or may not be accurate. And so I said, OK, let's call it that I have a 20 percent chance of success. That means it's going to take me five attempts on average, it could take more, it could take less, right? Like the odds don't always hold up, but on average, it's going to take me five attempts to get to a successful company. Let's say that my average failure takes two to three years to discover it's truly a failure. Some might, I've learned faster. Some might take the full two to three years. Let's call it an average of two years. That means I'm going to spend eight years and let's say I'm unlucky. So instead of my one out of five successes happening on my first try, second try, or third try, it's going to happen on my fifth try, right? So my first four attempts are going to be failures. I'm going to spend eight years of my life making no money, living off of nothing, getting punched in the face, and being seen as a failure and falling behind my peers. Okay, cool. Um, two, two years per failure, four failures. My fifth one's going to be the success. Now, let's say it's as, as small of a success as possible, right? Let's say I raise a seed round and I go out and raise a million bucks. And then we realize it's not going to be a unicorn. It's not even going to be a 50 or $100 million company. And so we end up doing a aqua hire or a, a small acquisition for $5 million, right? If I only raised a seed round of a million bucks, maybe... 200, 300K, 500K of pre-seed, it's very likely I'm still going to own 50% of the business at that point. And so I know these are all approximations and you could easily say, well, that still might not be that good of an outcome, right? But you have to make some assumptions in life and build systems around it. And so even in that situation, financially, right, I would end up netting one to $2 million and I looked at my job career prospects and I said, I don't think there's a job where I can guarantee how one and a half to $2 million in savings or one to one and a half million dollars in savings by the time I'm 32 to 33, right? And like, to me, that was my worst case scenario. That was if I spent eight years like failing and then had a very, very small, modest success after that. And it still took me three to four years to get to that success. And so it's like, when I just mathematically looked at it, I was like, I'm not losing out on anything financially. I don't have kids to support along the way. The only thing I have to be willing to tolerate is eight years of pain. And then I will be further along than I could be if I took the traditional career pathway, right? And so like, to me, it wasn't a risk. It was like, if I'm only willing to do this for two or three years, it's a risk. Cause then I'm betting that my first attempt has to be a success. But if I'm willing to commit to this long of a period of time, then I'm just playing the odds. I'm just playing the probabilities, right? And that, that doesn't just apply to the financial side. I know I dove into that, but it applies to the impact side. It applies to the autonomy side. It applies to the, the 
career trajectory side. And, and I kind of used that framework for every major decision I had to make. We had a really early aqua hire offer for major clarity that was one year in, which would have been an incredible, you know, outcome and win on my belt. And I just came up with the five categories I cared most about. I rated them on a scale of one to 10. I gave them scores for strength of outcome if I took the aqua hire versus if I kept going. And then I assigned probabilities to the likelihood of it happening. So for the aqua hire, all the probabilities were 100% because I knew I could take it. For the not continuing to go, I weighted it by my probability of success. And I just calculated it, calculated out the weighted average of each pathway. And I think you know, people get so caught up in the emotions of things. Um, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, but the emotional side or the fear is what's holding you back, like just taking a second and understanding that risk dynamics change over a long period of time versus over a short period of time and asking yourself if you have the ability to commit to the long period of time completely tr like changes that risk spectrum and that ambiguity spectrum and makes it a lot more advantageous to pursue entrepreneurial ventures. That's a really interesting perspective to rationalize those risks so it's less intimidating. All right, on that note, I think we're in a great place to start our Q&A. So if you're here in the hub, feel free to raise your hands or if you're just speaking up. You're gonna grab the yeah. mic. Hi, my name is Madeline, and I was wondering, do you ever wake up and you just feel like, I really don't want to work on my company's day, and then when that, if that happens, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So I, I would say yes and no, and I'm not trying to overcomplicate it, so I'm sorry. I've never had a day where I wake up and don't care about the mission or don't care about what we're trying to solve. I have certainly had days where I wake up and don't want to deal with whatever I'm having to deal with or don't want to execute on whatever I'm having to execute on in order to keep pursuing that mission or that vision, if that makes sense, right? Um, and I think, I think like the two things I try to do, and I don't do this perfectly, right? Like I, uh, I, I'm human. I have these funks. Everybody does, Right. But the two things I try to do is one, I remember that cliche story. I don't even know if this is real, but at this point, I let myself believe it's real because I've used it mentally so many times that there was some person who ran a marathon without any training because uh, there was light posts all along the way that were a hundred yards apart. And all they did was say, just get to the next light post, just get to the next light post. And then eventually they finished the marathon. And so it's like, I think it's like, it's really daunting you know, I'll break down like one of the hardest periods of time we had was um, I got sued for a couple million dollars right as we were running out of our pre-seed funding and needed to raise our seed round right as our growth was really starting to hit. And so it was like the worst of all worlds because things were finally working. But I had no money to keep going. I had no time to spend on that. And I was completely distracted. And it was just completely overwhelming. It was like, this company is going to go bankrupt. Like it's going to fail. It's going to whatever. And so what I would just do is try to really isolate things like, okay, you know what? I can't solve all of these problems, but I can solve this one narrow thing. And, and I, I would just try to focus on that. The other thing is, and this is very related to that, but you know, most of the things I believe or do, I just steal from other people who are smarter than me. Um, and I try to give them credit, but Warren Buffett, has had this really interesting principle and, and uh, fundamental, right? Which was, he would come up with his do not touch list, basically. So I forget if it was every year, every quarter, every month, I don't know. But at a certain period of time, he would come up with the top 20 priorities he had on his plate. Now, 20 priorities might sound like a lot, but if you think about like what he actually ran, Berkshire Hathaway owned over 20 companies. So that's less than one priority per company, right? he would cross off six through 20. And those would become his do not touch, do not think about lists. And he would only let himself think about those things once one through five were done. I think a lot of times that paralysis can come because we overwhelm ourselves by thinking about things so holistically, so long-term. You know, like I, I tell this to my, my sales team all the time. 
So many times they go into a deal and they're so obsessed with how do I win this deal? How do I close this deal? And I'm like, stop worrying about how to win the deal or how to close the deal because it's going to paralyze you because it's so complicated and so nuanced because there's so many steps that go into closing this six-figure deal or whatever it is. All you have to worry about is getting to the next step. When you're on a discovery call, the only thing you should be thinking about is getting them to a demo. When you're on a demo, the only thing you should be thinking about is getting them to loop in their colleagues who need to be a part of the decision. Once you've looped in those colleagues, the only thing you should be thinking about is getting them to ask you for a proposal, right? And, and I think it's kind of like, I've tried to use that same hack of, I think a lot of times that motivation comes from either being uh, overwhelmed or all these other reasons. Um, and so I just try to narrow what I'm thinking about and say, Hey, I'm just going to solve this one thing. It doesn't always perfectly work. You know, I think the last thing is, and I'll be, I'll be really fortunate here. So this one doesn't apply to me, but a lot of times people don't really care about what they're building. And in that case, I don't really have any advice. You know, I think that goes back to what I said at the beginning of like, you know, you can either want to be an entrepreneur because you just want to be an entrepreneur and you're constantly looking for hacks and ideas. And I have tons of friends who do that. They tinker with things all the time. And as soon as they don't want to work on something, they move on to the next thing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but that's going to be a big problem of, of what you just asked. Or there's the people who are just so obsessed. Like I could spend the rest of my life working on this problem I'm trying to solve and never get tired of it. So the lack of motivation really only comes from like the challenges or being tired or being a little bit burnt out. It never comes from like that higher level conviction or belief or, or love for what I'm actually trying to build. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Milo. So you just spoke about you could spend your whole life solving this problem. How exactly is um, the problem framed in, in your mind? How exactly do you think um, what the problem is? And how do you measure the impact of that? Because education can be kind of squishy and outcomes are hard to measure. So how do you specifically think about measuring that and um, what your company is on? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually perfect timing. Um, my marketing director and I just led a webinar for a couple hundred districts uh, yesterday on evaluating technology and like how it's working. So, you know, I caveat this with saying what I'm about to say can get a lot of strong support and a lot of strong disagreement in the education circles, but I'm going to say it anyway. People get way too caught up with um, efficacy research, right? And and uh, here's here's why I'm going to say that. That does not mean they don't get caught up enough with tracking outcomes and metrics and impact and all of these other things, right? I'm specifically talking about like long-term efficacy research. And here's what I'm going to say. So I don't know if you all are familiar with learning styles, but learning styles took the K-12 world by storm. I forget, 10, 15 years ago, whatever it was. It was like, oh, every student either learns kinesthetically or audio or through audio content or visual content the best. And we have to teach through that. And here's all this super in-depth, super important research that shows this is the only way we need to teach. And now the last five years, there's been all this research coming out that shows learning styles are, are debunked. And it, it's, it doesn't actually matter. It doesn't lead to better learning outcomes. It doesn't lead to better results. And so I say that to say, and like, even if you're not familiar with education research, just look at foods, look at diets, right? Every five years to 10 years, new research comes out that says what we thought 10 years ago was crap and that research is wrong and here's the right research. Also, go to Google Scholar and you can find research studies contradicting each other for almost any single topic, right? And so like research is what people make it out to be a lot of the times and people don't want to admit that, but it, it, it's just true. And so to, to me, being in college and career readiness, right? People say, oh, well, the research is, does this help a kid figure out what they want to do with their life? Well, if I'm doing something in seventh or eighth grade, and I want to know its impact on 100% helping a kid figure out what they want to do with their life, I'm going to have an eight to 10 year window until I can even actually truly start to understand if we were successful or not, which all that does is eliminate accountability for technology partners. All that does is eliminate accountability for the schools around these things, which is bogus, right? And because you need that accountability. And so sometimes you don't need to get so caught up in the research, just get caught up in the practicalities and the common sense. And actually the Carnegie Foundation, who does a ton of 
advocacy on how to do educational research has started really to push this. They call it practical measures, right? And it's not being worried about double blind research studies about the life impact 20 years from now. It's just worried about looking at the common sense. And so one specific example I can give in our situation to, to crystallize what I mean is, do I yet have data that shows our online test drives and interactive content has an X percent likelihood of helping a kid find their true career path 15 years from now? Absolutely not. We haven't even been in business that long, right? But what do we track? We track, are we getting students to make a higher degree of enrollments in career aligned electives based on their career exploration? So are we seeing that kids are watching our videos, doing our activities, and then going to their school counselor and enrolling in an elective that aligns to the things they just explored within our platform, right? Does that necessarily guarantee they're going to know what they want to major in college or they're going to know what they want to spend their life on? No, it doesn't. It's not true efficacy research, but it's just practical measures. It's saying, hey, we're influencing life decisions. We're influencing awareness. We're influencing conscientiousness. We're influencing X, Y, or Z, participation, activities, et cetera. And so that's how we really measure and focus on that impact. And we've had tremendous results there. We've shown that our content is 189% more uh, effective at getting kids to select a career aligned course plan of study in high school than kids who don't participate in our content and just take a generic career assessment. And so that's kind of where we've really focused on that impact. And, and to you, or the first question of what's the problem we're trying to solve, um, I want to lower the opportunity cost of figuring out what you want to do with your life and education uh, across the United States. So if you think about it, education is one of the only industries that exist that are all or nothing propositions. If you go to college, the way it's structured right now, this is starting to change. BYU is doing some amazing work here. But if you go to college and make it through three and a half years and drop out, you get nothing right? You get nothing formally that you can put on. You can say, oh, I earned this many credits. I get this. You don't have a degree. You don't have a certificate. That is an all or nothing proposition. To be asking 18 year olds to make all or nothing commitments that are four years long and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to me is asinine. We need to reverse engineer education to lower the opportunity cost of what people are doing to make it gradualized and sequential to what age appropriate actions are. So you go to William and Mary. If you leave after your freshman year, you get a certificate. If you leave after your sophomore year, you get a bachelor or a associate's degree. If you leave after four years, you get a bachelor's degree. And the only way to do that is to make it career aligned so we can make these things more specialized. That's not to say liberal arts doesn't have a place, but liberal arts education is a privilege, right? If you can afford the liberal arts education, that's great. I loved my liberal arts education. I'm very grateful for it. But right now, only 57% of kids nationwide graduate four-year colleges within six years, and 43% of those kids are underemployed. So that means only one out of three kids who enter the four-year college system end up with a job that required a bachelor's degree within six years of entering that four-year college system. And it's because we have an all-or-nothing built educational system, and that doesn't work for every single kid. We need to make it much more customizable. We need to make it much more sequential. We need to make it stackable. And we're starting by doing that in middle school and high school, something that's not super well known, but we actually acquired uh, an adult credentialing school last year. We're credentialing 600 adults a year in certified nursing assistant degrees, medical coding and billing degrees, et cetera, for people who don't want to go get a two-year degree, don't want to go to a four-year college, but want to get into the healthcare field and can get a two to three-month credential for $1,500 and get a $35,000 a year job. And that doesn't mean those people won't ever go to college. My hope is that a lot of those people love being a medical coding and billing assistant and then enroll in a four-year degree, but it's done sequentially instead of in this all or nothing proposition um, that teenagers have to opt into. So that's, that's the problem I'm trying to solve within the U.S. education system. Hi, my name is Alex, and I was curious, once you decided after college to not go and get a typical job and to pursue major clarity, what was the very first step you took? 
the very first step I took. All right, so I think that's a little bit of a loaded question and I'll, I'll say why, not because it's a loaded question, but just for my personal situation. So I'll try to answer in a way that's relevant to me, but then maybe also hopefully relevant to more people. But when I made that decision was right after I had found out that we had won this year long research study pilot partnership with New York City Department of Education. And so I kind of already knew we had somebody to build with and we had a partner to build with. So I'm, I'm saying that that wasn't the first step I took because that was already taken care of when I made the decision to go full time on it. If that wasn't the case, the very first step I would have taken would have been going in, talking to customers and trying to find pilot partners who had skin in the game to build with. Um, but since that was covered and that wasn't the case, the very first step I actually took wasn't really about major clarity. It was, I need to figure out how to live uh, for this next year because I have, I have not enough money left in the bank. And so um, it was actually just lining up things that would provide me some income while I would go facilitate and run this partnership with New York City to try to build a product out of that year-long partnership. So I taught at a summer camp a couple of weeks out at Stanford. I did odd jobs. You know, I did tutoring. I picked up some tutoring side gigs. I did a bunch of things. I worked for these on-demand platforms back when they were just starting off. And so because I already had like, oh, I have somebody to build with, but I'm not ready to go sell the product because it's not built yet, but I have the partner I'm building it with. Then my very first step was just focused on how can I make sure I have enough money that I don't die of starvation while I'm, I'm working on this thing? Thank you. Hi, Joe. <clears throat> Thanks for speaking with us all today. I had a question just about sort of the personal aspect of entrepreneurship. So I would guess at the start, is there any hesitation or even fear when you realize that you need maybe to bring some new people on and to outsource? Because obviously, you know your vision and you know where you want this to go. And is there fear whether it's, you know, is anybody even going to be interested in joining me? Or are they going to be too nervous? They're not going to know if I'm going to fail? Or do they, do they know my vision? You know, are they going to be able to implement it the way that I want? Um, obviously, they can bring certain things, and I'm sure your vision changed. But um, is there any, any hesitancy there? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And and absolutely, right? And I and and not just hesitancy on that side, like not just hesitancy on am I going to be able to convince anybody to want to do this journey with me, but also the hesitancy of should I, right? Like I know I feel convicted about this. I know I'm willing to do this, but what happens if I go and get two or three other people super excited about this who devote their life to this thing and then I totally screw it up or let them down or just ruin it all, right? And so I think there was hesitancy on both sides. And I think how I tried to approach that or solve for that was just being, you know, ruthlessly honest with myself going into those conversations about what I knew, what I didn't know, where we were at as a business, and the likelihood that any one person, whether it was an investor, whether it was a employee, whether it was a partner, was going to be right for wanting to work with us or wanting to join me on this journey. And so I say that because, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell wrote something, I forget the exact details of it, but it was like, hey, when you're at this stage, there's only 5% of people in the market who are ever going to be open to working with you. And then you get to this stage and there's 15%. And then you get to this stage and it's the next 30% of early adopters and, and blah, blah, blah. I kind of viewed everything in that category of like, for every investor I talk to, there's only going to be one out of a hundred who is actually a good fit for me. For every employee potential I talk to, same thing. For every school district I talk to, same thing. And so one, it then takes the pressure off of, I need to convince everybody to join me on this journey. Because if they say no, then I'm a failure and it's a stupid idea. Because I was almost going into it expecting, hey, I'm going to have to have a hundred of these conversations to find the one person who's going to be right for this. But two... It also allowed me to be more transparent and honest with those people. Um, you know, like I remember going to an investor event and one of the mentors was telling me, hey, you just have to put that you're going to do $25 million a year 
uh, in your fifth year in revenue? And I was like, well, I'm not, it's going to take me this long to get started. And that's not possible. And they were like, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's possible or not, but that's one of the filtering mechanisms investors use. And so you just have to put it. And then if it doesn't happen, just say, whatever, that was dependent on me raising $10 million and I never raised $10 million. So that's why we're not going to hit that number. And I was like, no, like that's, that's not who we are. That's not possible. So that's not what I'm going to do. And like, that's how I tried to approach all those conversations. Like I would tell employees, Hey, this is why I'm so excited. This is why I'm so passionate. I'm not trying to not sell you on the the job, but here's all the things that are going to suck about this job, right? Like we actually had a motto for our first 10 to 15 hires that were sell the vision, anti-sell the role, where we would tell people we're incredibly and passionate about the vision. We think we can change the world, but this job is going to suck. And here's all the reasons why the job is going to suck. So you let us know whether or not you're right for this. Um, and it, it alleviated some of that pressure, um, both on my side of wanting everybody to say yes, and on my side of feeling the guilt about potentially risking convincing people to do things that they otherwise wouldn't have done. I never wanted to convince an investor, an employee, or a partner to dive in who didn't want to do it on their own, right? Like I, my goal was never to change anyone's mind. My goal was just to find the people who were already naturally set up to wanting to be a part of that. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jonathan. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I might be misunderstanding this. Earlier you said like 57% of the students that actually graduate, 57% of people who go to college in this country graduate, and then about a third of them are unemployed. And your solution to this is you're going to like specialize them with specific degrees to link up to specific industries so that they'll have, they'll have a job after. But is the problem that these people's degrees aren't specialized to the industry that they want to go in? Or is there a fundamental lack of opportunities in these industries so that even when they do graduate with this degree from an industry, there's going to be so many of them that all look the same on paper that they need something else to, to differentiate themselves. Ultimately, we'd be with self so better than being a boy. Yeah. So, I mean, I think um, part of that is yes, but part of that is no, right? Like what you said applies to the underemployment challenge. So it's not unemployed, but underemployed, right? Like like hiring saturation or job demand and availability applies to the underemployment challenge. But what about the 40% of people who don't even graduate, right? Like that's clearly not because they got a degree and went out and couldn't get a job because they never even got the degree in the first place. Now, the reasons they never got that degree could be tied to a million things. It could be tied to financial circumstances. It could be tied to a lack of interest. It could be tied to learning success and that not being the right learning environment for them, right? But I think all of those things lend themselves to needing to help students be more conscientious about if four-year colleges are right for them or not before they get there. And so, like, to me, the way to, to solve that is to build more conscientious academic planning decision-making throughout middle school and high school with a greater awareness of what's out there. If you're only aware of three careers and you go to college because you want to be a doctor because your mom's a doctor, the likelihood that uh, being a doctor is right for you is way lower than if you're aware of 45 careers and you want to be a doctor because you explored 45 careers and that was your favorite one out of those 45. So, and it, this goes back to people getting so caught up in the research and efficacy that they missed the forest for the trees, right? Like, the way we can start chipping away at these problems is by increasing awareness, increasing conscientious decision making, and increasing the accessibility, availability, and like okayness and, and success of choosing alternatives to the four year college pathway. And so that's what we're doing at the middle school and high school level. We're increasing authentic and engaging exposure to understanding what actual career pathways are out there and available to them. We're increasing the conscientiousness about knowing what type of degree is needed for those jobs, how much education they need, what the costs of those degrees are, et cetera. And we're increasing awareness of the things you just mentioned, like what is the job availability? What are the job statistics? What's the job growth? What's the job outlook? What is the job presence in all of these different communities? Like our goal is not to tell a kid they have to go pursue a job. Our goal is to increase the awareness and conscientiousness of the decision-making process leading up to higher education. Like one of my biggest pet peeves is everybody's so obsessed with fixing student debt. Fixing student debt is not possible because student debt is the symptom of a problem. It's not an actual problem. 
It doesn't matter if the government funds college. It doesn't matter if uh, college is funded by private loans. It doesn't matter if college is funded by public loans. It doesn't matter if college is funded by ISAs, income share agreements, this whole new novel thing that's been blowing up in five years, but now is actually decreasing already. When you only have one out of three kids who goes through a system getting a job that can allow them to afford to pay back the cost of that education, it doesn't matter if it was funded from taxes, ISAs, or student debt. There's no economic output that allows you to solve for that in the first place. So we need a better filtering mechanism before they're even getting there so that kids are being more conscientious about what they're doing after high school, where they're going, what careers they're pursuing, and have a greater awareness of all of the options out there so they're able to make that much better of a decision. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, Miles, you might not it back, Uh, Hi, Miles again. Can you talk about how you got your first few customers? Yeah, absolutely. So honestly, it goes back to that customer development thing. Our very first customer was Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And we got them because... I, I mean, I just kept showing up in person. We had in-person meetings. I kept calling and building relationships. And I was so obsessed with the problems we were trying to solve that I remember being honest with them saying, hey, we don't have all the features. We don't have all this. We'll build these things, but we don't have all of this stuff, right? And we're new. We're three people. We're not some big, huge corporation with tons of money. But the CT director had sent me an email and he basically said, you know, hey, we want to work with you because... I haven't seen anybody your age who knows this much about the problem we're trying to solve. And so that's really how we got all of our first several customers, United Way, Southwest Virginia Partnership, Wake County, Virginia Beach County, and some others in Virginia was just spending a crap ton of time with them, obsessing and learning as much as we could, and then being transparent about, hey, we're not some huge corporation like with all this money or whatever else, but we know this problem intimately well. And we're going to commit to 100% figuring out how to solve this problem with you. And we're all in and, and building those relationships in person and just getting in the car and showing up places and, and spending that in-person time. Um, that, that's how we landed all of our first couple customers. Thank you. Yeah. Great. On that note, I think that's all of our time for today. But Joe, thank you so much for dedicating your time to us today and sharing your insights. It's been really great to hear about your story. Thank you.